Thank you. Uh, so as introduced, I'm Anne-Marie Slaughter. I'm the CEO of New America. I really uh, share the leadership of New America with Paul Butler there at the back, who is our president <laughs> and chief transformation officer. So um, it's wonderful to have all of you here. Many of you will have seen, uh, if you've had your cup of coffee, uh, they, the, uh, that we are dedicated to renewing the promise of America, which is of obviously a grand mission. We think of it as the promise with a capital P, the promise that is embedded in the Declaration of Independence uh, that we certainly did not live up to at that moment, but we strive to live up to and we continue to strive, a promise of equality and of equal rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and to a government of the people dedicated to the safety and welfare of that people. That's the part of the Declaration people often don't read, but it's in there too. As we approach our 250th anniversary uh, in 2026, we will be a very different America for the next 250 years. We will be a far more diverse America. And it is our commitment and our mission to see that we are an America where everyone is seen. We have work to do going back to acknowledge all the Americans who were ignored or oppressed or excluded or rendered invisible. That's important historical work. But going forward, everybody has to be at the table from the beginning. And that's why this work is so important and so much at the heart of what we're about. Because disabled Americans have been not seen, as I don't have to tell you, even until really quite recently, even as we have had wave after wave of inclusion, this work is really at the heart of ensuring that all Americans have equal opportunity, but equally important, that we as Americans, as a country, and as a world, get to benefit from the talents of all Americans. It works both ways. This particular part of education and technology and disability and putting those together to deliver this promise is as i said it's a it's a it's newer work for us but absolutely uh in, critical to how paul and i see this organization developing uh and really it's it's our education program is essential to everything. I, I, one of the biggest lessons I learned when I took over New America 10 years ago when I was from national security is that I now think early education is a national security issue. I think that the ability of all Americans, all people in our schools, to have an equal shot at having brains develop in ways that enable them to learn for the rest of their lives and to contribute for the rest of their lives is every bit as important as our defense budget. And if it were up to me, I would do a little shifting, but... Um, <laughs> so, uh, as we look at our education program, Birth uh, to Workforce, we're working to ensure that all students uh, have access to excellent teaching. I've already talked to a couple of you uh, about that. Uh, teaching and learning from birth through workforce. And of course, workforce, uh, as I approach my 65th birthday, I think work workforce just keeps extending, uh, <laughs> lifelong. Um, and we're particularly focused on designing systems improvements and innovations with students with disabilities in mind, again, from the start, right? This cannot be the afterthought that we squeeze in, that we work in. This is true for us for all policy. You have to have the people who are at the center of that policy at the center of the conversation from the beginning. Otherwise, you get fancy solutions designed and maybe implemented, maybe not, but even when they are, they often don't work. So from the beginning, uh, and this, uh, this here, this conference intersects that idea of being there from the beginning uh, with technology, education, and disability as sort of the three parts uh, of that conversation. 
We're particularly thrilled to be partnering with the Department of Education uh, on this event. It's, uh, we, we, we love our location because we're right at the heart uh, of the, at least around all the executive uh, departments. Uh, and I also, before I turn it over uh, to Ellery Robinson from the Department of Education, I want to thank uh, our entire education team, uh, particularly our higher ed, ed team and our, our pre-K through 12, Elena Silva uh, and her team, and also the New America events team uh, that has worked very hard uh, to make this, this event so that we live our commitments as accessible as possible and as inclusive as possible. So thank you all. I'll be able to stay at least for the first hour, and I'll be hearing about the rest of it. Ellery, thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. It's so great that you could join us and share about your work with New America. Um, I am Ellery Robinson. I am an impact fellow in the US Department of Education, Office of Educational Technology. The Office of EdTech develops national EdTech policy, establishes the vision for how technology can be used to transform teaching and learning, and how to make everywhere all the time learning possible for early education, K through 12, higher education, and adult education. As you all know, since you're here, the Office of EdTech has partnered with New America on how we can design accessibly from the start. I'm really excited to spend the day with all of you learning from and working with experts in this area. We are really honored to have our next speaker, the Assistant Secretary of Planning, Evaluation, and Policy Development at the US Department of Education, Roberto Rodriguez. Roberto's previous work includes Deputy Assistant for Education to President Barack Obama, Chief Counsel to Senator Edward, um, Edward Kennedy, and President and CEO of Teach Plus. As the Assistant Secretary, Roberto oversees numerous office, offices, including the Office of EdTech, uh, leads the development and review of the department's budget, and advises the secretary on all matters related to policy development, implementation, and review. Thank you so much for joining us, and please give um, a welcome to Roberto. It's great to be here with all of you in person and those of you joining virtually uh, as well. Uh, I'm so grateful to the uh, New America team uh, Anne-Marie and the uh, amazingly talented uh, education team here for bringing us all together and for their collaboration with our U.S. Department of Education and our administration on this important work. Uh, I, I just need to note, none of this would be possible. Uh, we wouldn't be here to get today without two individuals from my team that I really want to um, just acknowledge and applaud. First is Arlie Robinson, who you just heard from. Thank you, Arlie, for your leadership. <laughs> And the other is our outstanding Deputy Director of the Office of Educational Technology, Christina Ishmael, who's here. And Christina, thank you for all you do. It is really wonderful to uh, see such a diverse audience with us today, uh, really ready to roll their sleeves up and learn from each other and bake accessibility into uh, ed tech together. We have participants today on our agenda, our researchers, our policymakers, uh, our individuals with disabilities, our practitioners, uh, our advocates, uh, all coming together uh, to really underscore the importance of equitable access to educational technology. Uh, we know how important this topic is to our future. Uh, we know what a challenge the pandemic uh, exposed to see the impacts uh, of inequitable, inequitable access to technology uh, exposed even further. So, you know, that really helped us show how far we have yet to travel uh, to create equitable environments for all of our learners. And today you have an opportunity with a great agenda planned to learn from those at the forefront of this work, uh, to more importantly learn uh, from those who are experiencing and living accessibility and inaccessibility in ed tech each and every day. We need to center those voices first and foremost uh, in the work that we're exploring today. Um, while our administration continues to focus on uh, accessible education for all learners, we know that this work does not get done without each and every one of you in partnership. 
This is an all hands on deck moment that we have to seize. So I wanna thank each and every one of you for the role you play in our collective efforts toward greater accessibility in ed tech. At the Department of Education, we believe that technology is a bridge for improving opportunity, for improving outcomes in education for all learners. We're guided by three priorities in that work through our Office of Educational Technology. We're focused on digital inclusion, on doing more to make sure that uh, we have accessible opportunities for incorporating technology into the lives and learning of all of our students and individuals. We're focused secondly on learning ecosystems, on building and supporting um, thriving uh, and effective learning ecosystems and environments where education uh, through technology reaches the lives and learning of more of our individuals uh, and to support our educators uh, and those working directly with our students and individuals in that work. And thirdly, we're focused on emergent technologies. And this is an area that's really exciting for the topic we're exploring today to make sure that those emergent technologies are supporting safe, effective, and equitable uh, opportunities. If not integrated correctly, we also know that technology can increase barriers, right, particularly for our learners with disabilities. So as technology becomes a larger part of everyday life and learning, uh, it's increasingly important that effective technology is accessible for all learners. We know if we look across the country in our schools and in our districts, that the average number of tech products that our school districts use in a given month has almost tripled over the past several years, right? Students themselves use an average of 143 ed tech tools each school year. However, our individuals with disabilities consistently face a digital divide and a digital divide that's been compounded by inequitable access, right? As, as they're three times more likely to never go online than our individuals without disabilities. So given that one in four of our adults and 15% of our public school students have a documented disability, this is a must do. It is critical that we focus on accessibility as our North Star in this work around supporting educational technology and that we center the voices of our learners, of our educators, of our employees with disabilities. Their expertise, their experience, uh, their input to this work is critical. This is why we've dedicated at, at the Office of Educational Technology to focusing on our students with disabilities and our individuals with disabilities on providing full access for, for technology to advance uh, and, and to advancing their experiences in the work around our vision for accessibility. That, it, that vision is embedded in the framework that our Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, has talked about relative to raising the bar and supporting success for all learners. And we're really fortunate at the U.S. Department of Education to have several levers available to demonstrate our commitment to accessibility. The first of those is the, are the strategic investments that we make at the department each and every day. Uh, we have made historic investments in supporting uh, our districts and our states and our institutions of higher learning as they emerge from this pandemic, right? $130 billion uh, through the American Rescue Plan for our K-12 districts. Um, uh, a tremendously um, uh, so a tremendous amount of funding for our institutions of higher education to keep those doors of higher learning open for more students uh, as, as they worked through and emerged from the pandemic. And at our Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services and our Institute of Educational Sciences, we are also running discretionary grant programs to develop accessible ed tech specifically for learners with disabilities in mind. Secondly, we are using the lever of our policy and guidance uh, as a key driver in this work. Our agency continues to issue guidance on topics like accessibility and student privacy, mental health and professional development to ensure a more thoughtful approach to technology implementation in our classrooms. Our Office of Educational Technology recently uh, issued a report that I am very proud of uh, around uh, artificial intelligence in teaching and learning. Uh, 
uh, including a conversation that that report begins on how tools can be appropriately deployed in the service of effective teaching and learning practices for our students with disabilities. I hope that this is a topic that we'll have some opportunity to explore further today. And we are deep in the work right now at the U.S. Department of Education of updating our National Educational Technology Plan. There we're exploring three central themes as we develop that plan. The digital access divide, the digital design divide, and the digital use divide. And we're exploring those with particular attention to how to support our individuals and our students with disabilities in that work. A third way that we're doing more to advance this work is through the technical assistance that we provide our field every day uh, in connecting with our educators, with our district leaders, with our state leaders and policymakers. Based at CAST, our National Center on Accessible Educational Materials that's funded by our Department of Education provides specialized support and coaching and online resources to increase the availability and the use of accessible educational materials and technologies for learners with disabilities across the lifespan. And then finally, we have an essential uh, lever in evidence and in research and the work that we do there. That's in partnership with our wonderful colleagues at the Institute of Educational Sciences that are building the evidence base every day, disseminating that evidence base around how to improve educational practice and policy, and sharing that evidence in ways that connect with our educators and our parents, our policymakers, and the public at large. And within our National Center for Special Education Research, NIES, we're looking at supporting research to expand knowledge and understanding of the needs of our children with disabilities and to supporting services that are provided under and implemented by the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So we're proud and excited about all of that body of work underway at the federal level. We also recognize that meeting the moment here is not about a federal solution alone. It's not about that that series of investments or that body of work. It is about being a partner with our field in bringing to life the solutions, the opportunities that technology can unlock for learners in the future and enabling that technology to make change and to unleash opportunity in the lives of our individuals with disabilities. So I have a few asks for you. Uh, as you embark upon uh, the day. The first is for those of you designing and developing ed tech. Uh, please make sure that you find and center those that you can learn from in thinking about accessibility in the, in the development of ed tech tools. Hire and listen to those individuals in the work that you're doing. For our leaders and our investors in the room, recognize that this is a critical moment for ensuring that what's created and what is marketed is not just for some, but usable for all. For our researchers, understand that ed tech cannot support learning if it's not made for everyone, right? We still have to center that universal design and how we think about researching and developing those questions uh, around the use of educational technology in our classrooms and the lives of our learners. Let's keep, as a policy community, uh, let's keep learning from and listening to those on the ground as they consume and uh, experience the effects of those policies in their lives and in their learning each day. And to our educators and to our learners, you are the experts here. Let's continue using your experiences to better create and design and develop uh, new educational technologies uh, with your success in mind. Our individuals with disabilities need to be involved in this work from the beginning all the way through the end. We all have a responsibility to do that. And then finally, let's all remember our why. We do this work because this work is about our students' lives, their learning, and their futures. So as educators and education leaders, we all have an honor, we all share a duty, we all share a privilege of supporting the success of our students. 
um, each and every day. That's why we do our work and steward our mission at the U.S. Department of Education. That is why we are so proud to be here in partnership with the New America Foundation today and with all of you in moving forward to put accessibility front and center in ed tech and help to support the lives and learning of our individuals with disabilities. Thank you all so much. And uh, I look forward to all of the wonderful um, discussions and the sprint that uh, will take place later this afternoon. Thank you. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, we are, um, my name is An Mei Chung, and I um, at New America am very grateful to be here today um, with all of the panel and the guests in the room. And what we're going to first start doing is um, I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves, uh, and we will do Q&A with them, and then we'll have time for the audience um, for Q&A too as well. So get ready um, with any questions you might have. We will have time at the end for that. So, um, so I will start with Cynthia. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, my name is Cynthia Curry. I uh, use she, her, her, hers pronouns. I'm a middle-aged white woman. I am director of technical assistance at CAST. And uh, part of my role is as project director of the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials for Learning also known as just the AIM Center. Uh, we're a technical assistance center funded by the Office of Special Education Programs. Hi, it's great to be here. I'm Rylan Rogers. I'm a middle-aged white woman, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm the disability policy advisor at Microsoft, which is the funnest job in the world. <laughs> I get to use the voice of Microsoft to lean in on fundamental rights. It's great to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, it's good morning. Uh, my name is Ayamala Piano. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I am a young Afro-Latina woman, um, and I am the CEO and co-founder of SignSpeak. We are a cool innovation um, trying to recognize sign language into voice and voice back into sign language via an avatar using artificial intelligence. Hey, good morning. I am Paul Schrader. I uh, am with the American Printing House for the Blind. I use he, him pronouns. White male, brown hair with a lot of gray, beard that's white, which suggests that I've been at this for a while. And it's true, as a disability advocate, I've earned all that because we're always told, wait till next year. I don't have a lot of those left, and our students sure as heck don't have uh, another year to wait for education access in the technology space. So looking forward to talking about how we can do that. APH addresses that challenge with uh, textbooks, tools, and technologies designed for students who are blind or who have low vision. And we do that, thank you to the federal government uh, with its uh, appropriation from Congress and support from the Department of Education, which we very much appreciate. Great, well thank you. And again, my name is Ann May. I'm here with New America. I am a oh, middle-aged Asian woman <laughs> who still has mostly black hair, right? So, um, but very excited to be here. All right, so we're gonna start with the first question for all of you, which is what does accessibility mean to you both personally and professionally? You wanna start, Cynthia? Sure, I'll, I will certainly start. I, I think of accessibility as really about belonging. Um, and accessibility, uh, thinking about the environment and making sure that an individual is able to experience everything within that environment, including anything that needs to be interacted with, um, and that there are no barriers in the way for that person to be successful. Uh, and we like to think of accessibility, you know, at CAS and at the AIM Center, really being centered on individuals with disabilities. Uh, that's very different from availability. Um, we use, tend to, to use the term ex, you know, accessible a lot and very liberally, so we tend to really start to focus people back to accessibility as being part of uh, individual access uh, related to an individual's function. 
This is Rylan, and um, I love being here in this space for what it means to me because I think back um, to the fact that I was sort of born for this to matter. I was born in 1975, which many of you know is the year that the United States first had special education um, legislation and the right to a free and appropriate public education. That was transformative in my life because when I showed up in kindergarten, I was amongst the first generation of students with disabilities who had an IEP all the way through. And I think about that empowerment and what it's meant to me and what other aspects of accessibility have meant to my ability to contribute to our world and our community. And that transformation is what I always think about in terms of accessibility. And I also think about the work left to be done and who hasn't had those experiences and the privilege and how 48 years later, there's still a big gap. Um, so that's horrifying to think about how old I am, but it's more horrifying to think about the work that's left to be done in terms of accessibility. And as I mentioned at Microsoft, we think about accessibility as a fundamental right. This is Yami. Um, personally, I think I was having this conversation with my co-founder, Nicholas, this morning. And I think the way that I view accessibility um, personally is that it's not just a meaning or something we write on a wall, but how do we transform that into action, right? So for me, it's the action of empowering individuals of all abilities to thrive in a society that uh, needs a lot of redesign for them um, because it was not created with them in mind to start with. So I really want to use my privilege as an able-bodied individual to be able to sort of enforce that and, and use my voice to echo um, sort of what they need and what they tell me they need. Um, in terms of my professional life, being accessibility has a very significant meaning because I, I work in the space. So for me, it's very much surrounding how do we give language access to individuals um, throughout their entire life, whether that is I'm walking into Nike to, you know, I need an emergency conversation with my banker and so how do we do that in a way that is accessible and appropriate? Um, so that is what it means to me professionally. You know, when I, when I think about accessibility, it's, it, this is Paul Trader, it's kind of a, a true north compass direction in my, in my view, which, which means it's a goal, it's a principle, it's important to have the kind of markers that, we, that my colleagues have just talked about in terms of accessibility. But, but I also know, having lived a few more years even than Ryland over here, um, uh, <laughs> that accessibility often is honored in the breach. And, uh, I remember when we were working on some legislation back in the turn of the 21st century to address textbook accessibility. Yeah, 2003, we're talking about how do we get books into the hands of blind kids in a timely fashion? That's, you know, what, 20 years ago. Um, so it's not like we were talking about that at the dawn of time. We were talking about that 20 years ago. And one of the parents that we had uh, told the story about getting a call from her school principal to say, hey, could you leave your, your, could you keep your daughter home next Monday? Why? Well, we're doing, we're doing the state testing and, and uh, we, uh, uh, we, don't have a, we don't have that accessible for her. Um, and, and that's, I lived that story too, right, as a blind student growing up. So we can talk the great game and we will and, and it's important and it's essential. But the reality is that there are so many ways that accessibility comes apart, often right there at the level of the street level, the implementation, the classroom, the workplace, where the principal doesn't quite come through. And so we need to set all of the standards and guidance that we can in place, but we also need to recognize that a lot of it is still addressing those attitudes so that the school principal thinks maybe six months in advance hey, let's make sure we test, we know testing's coming up. It's not a surprise. We've got a blind student. Let's figure out how we address that. And by the way, they could have called the American Printing House for the Blind to, uh, to address that testing accessibility challenge. This is on me. Thank you. Um, so one question in terms of you all have alluded it to uh, some extent. Um, how has the field of ed tech changed and accessibility evolved since the time you've been doing this work? I'll, I'll jump in. This is, uh, this is Cynthia. Um, I have been working in this area since 2000, so I too have 
seniority over Ryland on age. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. Um, so so wisdom, I, wisdom, wisdom. Right, wisdom, right. Yes. I have more wisdom. Excellent. <laughs> <You> hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so when I started in 2000, um, you know, the, the first version of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines had just been released. So we were thinking about websites, right? And it was a lot of focus on commercial websites, higher ed websites. Um, now we're, uh, 3.0 uh, is on the horizon for the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And in the meantime, there's been an explosion, not only of more complexity of websites, but also the introduction of enormous numbers of non-web-based uh, digital applications. So in addition to that, we have school districts that are adopting these technologies through multiple pathways, um, not just through formal procurement at the systems level, but we have teachers who have the freedom in many cases to choose applications that you know, match uh, their, you know, the pedagogy and the curriculum and the, and the goals that they're, that they're teaching. So at the system level and even more close, closer to more close to students, we're finding that there's not enough attention, enough, enough experience uh, around what does accessibility mean, and embedding that process and those considerations. Uh, in 2021 to 2022, uh, there were over 1,400 ed tech applications that were being adopted by school districts on a monthly, uh, used on a monthly basis. And that had tripled uh, since the 2017-2018 school year. So we're just seeing uh, a lot more complexity, uh, a lot more you know, volume of ed tech being used in classrooms. But on the other hand, we're also seeing a lot of, a lot of interest. You know, an event like this is really exciting to me. Um, when I started in this field in 2000, that we didn't have a lot of company. There weren't, you know, there weren't many of us doing this work, probably on a, you know, one hand could count the organizations and individuals that were working in this area. And now it doesn't surprise me when I come across uh, a name or an organization that I didn't know was working in this area. Um, so there's, there's a, a growing, uh, recognition, a growing awareness of the need, and I think that's relatively new in the past uh, you know, five, five to ten years, and that excites me. Yeah, this is Rylan. I think I'll, I'll add a couple of things. Um, in addition to my own lived experience, I had the privilege of raising two now young adults um, and off my payroll um, individuals <laughs> with disabilities, and so I got to see their experience with what the options were in technology from kindergarten to college graduation. And um, so my son was born in 1997, and my daughter was born in 2000, so you think of that window of time. And it was astonishing, the difference. Um, I remember being in a, a very enjoyable IEP meeting um, prior to kindergarten, uh, talking about we needed to have voice input, input um, for a computer. And the concept that we needed a computer and we needed this very expensive software. And then I remember when my daughter was in high school and she showed me her latest favorite app that was cost zero dollars. And I thought, I spent $3,000 of my own <laughs> money because the school was taking too long and now it's free. So I think that's an interesting transformation that while the tech has accelerated and things that we used to think about as assistive technology are now accessible by design, but the gap that exists and that not everything is designed in a way that meets the needs of students with disabilities and certainly not everything's designed in a way that connects with assistive technology. So while there's progress, there's this tension of gap and then I also spend a lot of time recently thinking about what's coming next, because there's a little thing called AI. And what excites me is how can it accelerate accessibility, but then there's, the, again, the challenge and the risk. So there's so many layers to how quickly we've gotten progress and how much disparity there is and what's being applied and experienced. This is Yami. I think that there has been a great, improvements in accessibility. And I by no mean, and I'm 
an expert in this room. There's educators, there's policymakers in the room that um, know more than me in, in certain topics. I think where I see room to grow is definitely in expanding more onto definitions that we already use. For example, there are great initiatives around English learners, right, and, and how do we empower them? So why don't we include, how do we include sign language in the classrooms in a more accessible manner, considering that sign language is its own language, right? So looking at ways of including accessibility within the initiatives that we currently have and shaping those perspectives so that technology and education can meet in a very interesting way that can empower these students to have the language access that they need. And sort of piggybacking to what was just said, I think that we're in a point in time where AI can transform the way that we do accessibility um, to Paul's point. How do we make implementation in the classrooms a little easier? How do we make Make sure that you know the teachers get the support that they need to understand these technologies. So all these things, I think, are a catalyst. We're in a in a moment in time where we can catalyze a community to come together and view it from different perspectives, so that students get what they need at their early stages, so that they can thrive in our society and be members, um, you know, that are happy because that's what we want. We uh, in the in the blindness world, and I think in, in the, the world of uh, individuals with significant disabilities, technology has obviously made, made a huge difference uh, in, in accessing material, accessing content, addressing issues related to disability. Um, so just for fun, I, I did uh, bring some toys. Um, so I'm holding in my hand a small device. It's called the Chameleon. It's made by the American Printing House for the Blind in cooperation with a partner. It has a 20 cell braille display. The input keys are designed based on the Braille code, so it's six dots. Um, very simple, very small, uh, but limited in a sense that it's one line. Um, we are now in beta on something called the Monarch, which I'm now holding up. Uh, I did this at a testimony recently, which my daughter watched, and she helpfully said, Dad, you hold up like a blind man. And I, I <laughs> forgot to get advice on how I should actually hold a product. I, uh, I I should go to the home shopping network, I guess. Um, <laughs> but uh, this device has uh, 10 lines of Braille, 32 cells across. And um, I, I can't be fast enough to show it to you. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe hold it up later. Graphics on the same surface. So on the same surface that I've got those multi lines of Braille, I can, I can effortlessly almost switch to a tactile graphic. Um, and I remember in uh, my high school years, my econ teacher, who, who was very <laughs> clever, uh, we're talking about supply demand curves and came over with a roll of masking tape and sort of did a version of that on a folder for me, um, which in a way is a great version of accessibility, right? A, a clever teacher uh, taking the step to do something that could have been provided if I had had this device available to me uh, in real time and in a much more expansive way. But I got the sense of what the curve was trying to indicate. And so in a sense, the work was done. I used to play this fun game. My daughters are, are also young adults and, and also off the payroll, yay. Um, so um, when they were going through school in Montgomery County, hereby, and I understand we've got some MoCo people uh, that were registered, so yay MoCo, good, good school system. They did, they, you'd done them well, they, they were very successful. Uh, we used to play this fun game of, I wonder how I could use that Promethean board in your classroom if I were there as a blind student, what would they be doing? Um, and you know, they, as kids, will quickly tired of dad's pestering and annoying questions about how would we make, you, how would we make the classroom accessible. But it was an interesting exercise in just sort of thinking through what would that be, what would my education be like today? Um, we still, it's relatively straightforward, right, to address the platform accessibility. We know how to do that. CAST has done a lot of great work, the Web Accessibility Initiative. Lots of people have done great work in describing how to make software, hardware accessible and usable. Microsoft has filled in a lot of those gaps. Um, that part is, is relatively straightforward, although I would say to the Department of Education, one thing that would be helpful, I mean, I loved all the initiatives, but you know, how about a straightforward piece of legislation sent over to Congress that requires accessibility of all this material being put into the classroom? Um, that part, so the platform is addressable, the hardware that it's delivered from, relatively so, although still a lot of reliance on visual uh, components, but you know, again, we can, we can deal with that. 
Where we run into trouble always has been true since the dawn of time is at the content creation standpoint. Um, and addressing accessibility there, I, one of the studies that I saw recently was um, in just uh, three or four years, really pre-COVID to post-COVID, teachers say they went from roughly 70% of their content being uh, in the, the, the education content being based on textbooks to about 30%, right? So the rest of it's filled in with open ed resources, other kinds of teacher created or provided, uh, system provided bits of content uh, that are uh, provided in lots of different ways. And my, my expectation is that most of that content, there's no one addressing uh, the accessibility of it. Now, there, there may be in places, and I'm sure there are in places, I'm sure there are very good people doing the work of making sure uh, that we're looking at how to provide and, and, and prepare that information in a way that can be transmitted and provide it accessibly to people with, with various disabilities. But, it's, but there's nothing that requires that, um, and there's nothing that makes that, makes that happen uh, absent uh, good, good effort. And so you've got content creation is a place where this can fall apart. And frankly, uh, technology procurement is the other place where this easily falls apart uh, because school systems have procurement systems that may, officials that may or may not know about accessibility, worry about accessibility, care about accessibility. Uh, and then finally, at the end of that pipeline, um, things like this monarch that I'm holding in my hand, which are extraordinarily expensive, um, but are extraordinarily critical because in the end, um, no one other than a specialized company is going to provide the kind of assistive technology that allows me to have Braille under my fingertips in the same way uh, that routinely we are providing information at the, at the eye level for people who can see it. And so we need to have assistive technology in, uh, in the ecosystem, in, in the decision-making structure, and in the procurement systems as well to make sure the students can have access where they need it to technology, uh, to, the, uh, to the content in a way that meets their specific needs. Okay. This is on May. Um, Cynthia, we've heard a lot um, just amongst you all about the terminology accessible technology and assistive technology. And uh, what would you say um, help us understand like, well, how you define and differentiate the two? It's a really, really important question, which I'm so glad that this was, um, that this is part of the, the panel. Um, on the screen is a display of, of three different terms that all interrelate if we're going to make uh, accessibility happen uh, with, within an environment. And oftentimes these three terms are considered in isolation, uh, especially within consideration of the needs of individuals with disabilities, but it's critical that they all be uh, considered together. And we heard everybody on the panel allude to this, but this graphic kind of uh, makes it clear. So uh, there are three different parts that are displayed on the visual. One is assistive technology, and then there's material, and then there's uh, technology. So breaking out each of these individual parts uh, is essential to make sh making sure that accessibility is, is working within an environment and particularly with digital accessibility. So the assistive technology, that is really what supports an individual's functioning. So it is, it's individualized uh, for students who have sensory disabilities, uh, physical disabilities, mobility. So it's something that's matched specifically and if it's done right, uh, we're using something like Joy Zabala's set framework, student environment tasks and tools, and it's very much individualized for that individual to be successful. And though that assistive technology can change depending on the environment, uh, what the context is. So it really, uh, it's not just one thing, it is designed specifically and matched uh, to the individual's needs. Then you introduce that individual who uses assistive technology into an environment of, say, general education, and it's gonna be essential that that assistive technology is interoperable with what is selected for that general education environment. And it's not just the material, it's not just the technology, but it's, it's both. The AT needs to be able to be interoperable and work with both the material and the technology that's selected in general education. So the distinction there is that the material it's, it's the content or the information of the curriculum, and that can be in any format. That's video, it could be text, it could be audio, graphics, uh, and today, as, as, as we've all been talking about, the, the types and formats of the material has just, is, it's highly variable. Um, so we need to be thinking about 
Is that material accessible? Is it designed from the beginning to be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust, and match uh, the web content accessibility guidelines and accessibility standards? And then there's uh, the technology, and the technology is what delivers that material. So that's everything from a learning management system to a digital book platform to the video player that's delivering the, the video material. That too needs to work with an individual's assistive technology. So we often find, uh, particularly in IEP meetings, that the team will consider the student's need for AT and stop there. And that is not going to, uh, that's not going to produce accessibility for that student and it's not going to provide equal access uh, or their opportunity to be independent, uh, to make progress uh, in the general education curriculum. So it's really essential. This is what makes accessibility um, happen at, at CAST and the AIM Center. Uh, we really defer to the Office for Civil Rights definition of accessible, and that is that an individual with a disability can access the same information, uh, interact uh, with the same, or engage with the same interactions, enjoy the same services as an individual without a disability. But there are three really essential uh, conditions for that, and that's equally integrated, equally effective, and substantially equivalent ease of use. So it's not just a matter, of, to you know, Paul's point, about 2003 and getting textbooks to students. It's not just, it was many, many cases, students were getting their textbooks in Braille or audio or other format. It just happened to be six months late. Uh, so we're not, that's making it available. It's not accessible. So equally, equally you know, equivalent uh, really means at the same time. It means at the same quality. It doesn't have to be the same thing, but it needs to be, it needs to, give the student the same opportunity as students without disabilities, without additional burden on the student, the family, or the educators. Thank you. This is Rylan, can I jump in a little bit? Sure, absolutely. I love that you talked about sort of one of the challenges of not really thinking it through at the IEP level, um, because I think this is a really important point for us to be thinking about right now, and it's at that practice level, but it's really also at the policy level because technology and educational experience has transformed where digital information is now a part of every, not every, but the majority of students' experiences. And many technology has also, many sort of mainstream technology has also transformed that there's accessibility built into it. But we're seeing that that's not part of the conversation. So when you think about if it's a one-to-one -one laptop setting, then the decision might be made for a student with disability not to talk about assistive technology anymore. And that's a mistake because we have to think about whether they need aftermarket assistive technology or whether they need to be sure that the things that are built in are turned on because too often schools and other settings are turning off the accessibility features um, for a variety of reasons. So the conversation has to shift to think about the world of technology as it exists now and where it's going, and how do we change our policies to reflect that to ensure that the real intent of assistive technology is now meeting the needs of students in this new digital age. Marilyn, can I follow up on that um, in terms of, of um, the role of, of technology at Microsoft and its impact on accessibility? What has been the journey at Microsoft? Because you know, it sounds like it's an important part of what Microsoft is focused on now. I love that you started with the word journey because any effort at accessibility has to be a journey. And it's learning and frankly, for Microsoft and others, it's failing. Um, there have been times where our intention to ensure that we are delivering accessibility with our products hasn't met the needs of communities, and we've heard from partners um, immediately, and that's critical. But at this point, we really think about accessibility as, again, a fundamental right, and it's built into everything that the company does. That includes making sure that disabled talents are part of the creators that are driving technology forward. That gives us actually a superpower in designing a world that is more accessible. It's also critical to think about um, how do you make sure that something is accessible by design. And when we think about disability and accessibility, we're thinking very broadly, you know, all types of disability experience, um, because many of us in, that are disabled, it is not one part 
or one segment of our identity, it intersects with other issues. So really thinking that through holistically about what accessibility means and how do we deliver that. Um, and I think the other piece that's so important is that the awareness that while we've made great progress in things like live captions that are available on and offline in Windows 11, um, things like a great um, screen reader that's part of Edge, that is not the right fit and meet all, everyone's needs. And we still have to make sure that our technology connects with af aftermarket assistive technology for the segment of people where accessible by design is still not meeting that individual need. So it's an interesting balance. And I think it really speaks to the need to evolve, take that feedback, learn and grow, which has to be the work of accessibility for all of us. Paul. Oh. To follow up on that, given all the work you've done um, around policy, how do you think um, companies like Microsoft could be helpful in furthering policy <laughs> priorities? <laughs> well, let me tell no you. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, a couple of things that, that uh, I've learned on this journey. One is that, generally speaking, um, it, it, the, the companies that are involved in providing um, technology that I've had a chance to work with want to do good work, want to do accessible work, want to address accessibility. Most of the companies have invested in strong systems, people, and content to, to, to do that. And I, and I really appreciate what Microsoft has done. I appreciate what some of the other companies that I know are represented here have done. When we were doing the work to improve textbook accessibility, um, we got the, the publishers got on board. Now, they might have been pushed a little bit by the fact that some states were starting to do stuff. And, and now, you know, Texas is starting to look at open, ed, open education resources. And I'm, I'm hoping that it's not, it's not addressing accessibility yet, but I'm hoping, at least I don't think it's clear in there yet, but I'm hoping they get to it because that's kind of the path we went with textbooks. But ultimately, the publishers got on board. And we used to joke that we would go into congressional meetings and the disability advocates really didn't have to say anything because our publisher colleagues were doing it just fine. They were they were impassioned. They were really talking, and they and they were and it wasn't it wasn't smoke. They really believed it, and they really understood the importance of trying to make sure that people uh, students could make use of the content they were publishing in these in these books. Um, so I, I think there's a, a lot of, of good work happening, and I, I you know what what technology companies always used to tell us is you know set set guidance, and, but don't tell us how to do things. And my response back on that was, my kids tell me that too, but if I don't tell them specifically how to do things, <laughs> frequently that guidance just gets ignored. And so, <laughs> you know, I do, I, I think it's important, and I think companies would acknowledge this, right? For the most, and Rylan, you just kind of pointed this out, it, it, is, it is complex to address disability accessibility. I think we kid ourselves if we think it's not. It is complex because needs are complex, because individual differences are complex. Um, I am one of the least able people in my company when it comes to technology, and they will tell you that, and I will agree with them. Um, but, I, but I rely on it every day, and I, and I love it. And so um, there are so, and, and you know, at APH, we address the needs of people who are blind or low vision, but who also have multiple other disabilities. And honestly, there are groups that I don't think we serve that well. Uh, because it is extraordinarily challenging. And so what I think is helpful is to have very clear, call them guidelines, call them standards, but so that everyone knows what we're working toward. So it's not just sort of this nebulous, make something that's accessible to the widest possible number of users and various kinds of usability needs. You've got to be more specific. And, and I think you know we've got uh, Section 508 experience in this country, which is a government procurement requirement for technology uh, accessibility. Um, we've got the Web Accessibility Initiative. Um, we've got our work on textbooks that dealt with making that content accessible. And in some ways, we've learned a lot of things in that process. We've improved on some of those that we can address, like Web Accessibility Initiative, where we can continue to iterate. Um, and we keep learning more and we keep you know, trying to address more to help give more specific guidance. And so I am a policy person. I do think ultimately that requirements need to be in place because I think as good as everyone wants to be, it falls apart at the level where an official's making a decision about what book 
what technology they're going to put into the classroom next year. And oftentimes, that's where, uh, as I said before, accessibility comes apart. And so we need the requirements to address that. That was why we needed something in the textbook space, because we needed requirements to make it clear to schools, you have a duty to make sure that you are getting uh, an accessible digital file of this book so that it can be transformed. But we made mistakes, and we're still living with those because it, it sounds like the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act may never be reauthorized. Um, it's been since 2004, and there's changes that need to happen in that law. That's the downside of a legislative solution, that it gets locked. And I know that, and I, and I understand that's, that is a downside. Uh, but, it is, but it does set, we do set clear rules for the road. Um, and just for fun, by the way, I, I used ChatGPT, and I said, write me a piece of legislation for accessible uh, education technology. And it actually did a pretty, pretty fair job. It <laughs> called upon the Department of Education to create guidelines. So um, <laughs> Assistant Secretary, you've got your job ahead of you. Uh, and it called upon uh, uh, to ensure compliance of, of uh, digital educational instructional material, including OERs, uh, provide, developed, used in the classroom. And it talked about certain accessibility requirements that should be built in. So you know, the chat's getting there. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, um, speaking of, oh, go and, ahead. and may I add something I think is very important to think about this problem outside of big companies. Um, I think we need to empower innovation for people of all abilities to be able to innovate within their space. Um, as someone in the entrepreneurship not, like journey, I think one of the biggest challenges um, that we face is that the the, the capital is concentrated in certain areas, and we haven't diversified that enough to bring enough innovation into the front, into the, the, the forefront of accessibility, getting capital to people of different abilities to be able to innovate within their communities. And when we rely on private investors to do that, they will tell you the blunt truth is, this is a niche market. We don't see returns. So and so. Um, at ScienceSpeak, we've been very lucky that we've been able to partner with social impact funds that see just besides the returns, they see the immense amount of impact that it can do to the life of millions of individuals. But, but sort of changing the dichotomy of like, let's depend on the big corporations to do something, to let's empower everyone to think about creative ways of bringing innovations to everyone's lives. Because I think that at the end of the day, a bottom up approach and a top-down approach can meet at the middle and do some really great, interesting work. Thanks. Um, so speaking about where it fails, you know, according <laughs> to Paul, um, what does it take for like a state or a school district to coordinate around all the issues and things that need to happen to make sure that all students have accessible? Like, we know that's not happening, but what needs to happen? So Cynthia? Sure, so this is the work of the, of the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials, and I can say we have seen um, a, lot of, a lot of progress, especially in the past uh, three to five years. So at the AIMS Center, uh, we have a cohort of seven states uh, for which we're providing intensive technical assistance. So for each of those individual seven states, uh, we work closely. Uh, on, pro on progressing through what are called our AIM Center's quality indicators for providing accessible educational materials. And each of those seven states are also working uh, with three school districts, uh, some of them more, and they're working you know, together. The partnerships are so important. Um, you know, we've tried to work solely with school districts, tried to work solely with state education agencies. It really is so important for states and districts to work together, so the state to your point about top up, uh, top down, bottom up. You know the state is developing uh, policies, and then the districts are implementing them, giving feedback to the state, iterating before scaling statewide, and we're seeing some success, uh, even in procurement. Um, so the, the seven states, in case if you're, if those of you who, who are are working or living in any of these states, to I can connect you with these people. Really, the the more cooperation and coordination, the better. It's Georgia, Missouri, New Hampshire. Uh, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Oregon, and West Virginia. And uh, for example, in, uh, in Missouri, one of their states, uh, one, of, one of their districts, uh, Francis Howell has gone through two procurement processes for digital curriculum, one in science and one in math. 
and have had tremendous success at uh, communicating digital accessibility requirements as part of the procurement procedure, putting in communication supports in negotiating with vendors, uh, and they have had great success across the district. So the partnerships are so important um, to make that coordination work. It's not just the special ed or AT, it's the procurement people, it's administration, and it's coordination across content areas as well. So we are starting to, um, to see some of the success of coordination state and district. That's great. Uh, this is Anmay, and um, before we open it up to Q&A, um, Yama, can you tell us more about how you started SignSpeak and why, and, and what is it? <laughs> well, that's a fantastic question. So um, my co-founder, Nicholas Kelly, is in the room, so he would be more than happy to talk to you guys about how we started, but really SignSpeak started with his frustration around accessibility as a deaf person. Um, it really started at the National Institute of the Deaf, um, where we met, uh, where he met our third co-founder who's not here today, Nicholas Wilkins. He is an ex-Google engineer, um, knows American Sign Language, and, and really was enamored with solving this problem. Um, and they sort of won Tiger Tank, which is like this pitch competitions at, at RIT. Um, they somehow, through a mutual friend, found me. I was living in DC at the time, um, and I went to American University, and then I worked at Fannie Mae, once an eagle, always an eagle. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Paul went to AU too. Um, and, and really, he pulled me into this because I, for me, it was a dull moment, right? We have Siri enabling voice recognition. We have so many great technologies enabled through voice, and I am like, why doesn't this not exist for sign language? And a lot of people think of sign language recognition as enabling hearing and deaf to talk with each other, but people don't see that this can enable deaf and deaf communication, right? And being able to allow the deaf community to unite in a way that is extremely unique, right? And, and really, really powerful, because I think in unite, there's, there's a strong force there. So um, fast forward, um, the sign speak is is a sign language recognition technology that translates sign language into text and voice back into sign language via an avatar. We actually have the technology today here. We would love for people to try it um, during lunchtime. And again, um, going back to trial and error, this is a journey and we're looking for feedback. You guys are experts in things that we're not experts in, and we would love to eventually be a resource to all of you. So ideas are always welcome, and um, ways to improving the technology is always welcome. Um, we just finished fundraising our pre-seed round, which was a strong feat to prove to investors what it takes. We also got a National Science Foundation grant um, that is enabling to continue doing this work. And part of this money um, is being used to pour back into the deaf and hard of hearing talent pool. We just hired our first ML engineer who's also deaf um, and encouraging people to do a crowdsourcing data platform where we have gamified data collection for them and we incentivize them through little um, to monetary returns to give us some data. So it's a really exciting time for us at ScienceSpeak. Come check out the technology. We're always improving it. Um, and it's been an amazing journey. And I'm so glad that Nico allowed me to be part of this team. Because at the end of the day, something that I'm really, really proud of, of our company is that we've been able to bring in the deaf and hearing perspective to create something amazing. And diversity and inclusion is the ability to bring people from different experiences to make something great. And having grace with each other, right? Like, Nico has educated me, I've educated Nico, and same thing with our team. So it's been a lot of learning, a lot of failing. Um, a lot of crying, a lot of late nights. Um, but at the end of the day, we're excited to get this to where it needs to get so that we can provide more accessibility to the world. Thank you. All right, we're gonna open it up to questions um, from the audience. And if you have a question, um, there is a microphone roaming around. So raise your hand if you have a question for anyone on the panel. Don't be shy. Yes, don't be shy. Gabriel. Um. Hello, um, my name is Gabriel. I'm in third grade. 
I use the C pen to help me read um, and my question is what types of technology for reading um, do you make? Hmm. Um. Well, I, I can jump in a little bit. Um, at the, this is Paul with the American Printing House for the Blind. We actually do address uh, a couple of different ways at getting at uh, reading. So one of those is Braille devices, and I, I held up a couple of those. I actually also brought a handheld magnification device. We have a few of those in our um, collection of devices. So for people with low vision, um, this handheld device affords access to the, to the content at the front of the classroom and to the content on the desk or to reading uh, content uh, pages however they wish. Um, the, there are also lots of wonderful digital uh, tech devices that allow for reading of uh, both digital text and various kinds of audio files for, for reading that sort of material as well. Uh, and, and obviously lots of work that has been done to make that digital text usable for lots of people who, for whom print reading is not, uh, not a first uh, e easily accessible way of getting access to print. This is Rylan with Microsoft, um, and the sort of answer is big in terms of lots of different choices. A lot of people know about a set of tools we have called Immersive Reader that allows you to set the text, and by text it can be something you wrote, it can be something from the internet, lots of different ways to get the text in different ways to make it um, more accessible for you. It was designed for students with dyslexia. I'm dyslexic, so it lets you put a color overlay if you're a person for whom that works. It lets you break things down one word at a time or one syllable at a time. My, one of my favorite parts about it is it lets me sort of click and ask a question if I'm stuck in terms of um, uncoding a word. And then, the fun thing about Immersive Reader to me is that while it was designed for a very particular educational use, it's now being used by lots of people as part of the way they enjoy reading um, by listening. So it's now part of our browser. Anybody can turn it on. Um, I wanted to listen to an article from the Washington Post this morning while I was walking over here, and I did it through my headphones with Immersive Reader. So the idea of what technology does to change how we're all reading and consuming is fun to think about. But I would say back to you, what we really need to know is what else do you need and want because those next solutions are going to come from you and other students like you. This is Cynthia, if I could just add, add one thing. Um, I love that you called out a, a tool that you're, that you're using, the, the C-Pen, uh, which is a, an essential tool as are a lot of optical character recognition apps. And these are, you know, these are tools that, that help retrofit what's inaccessible to a student. And I think it's really important to make the distinction there because thinking back to the graphic of assistive technology, accessible material, and accessible technology, that C-Pen or the OCR app, that's assistive technology working in isolation because the material and the technology are not accessible. So adding that additional tool for a student is not equally equivalent, uh, effectively, effectively integrated, um, uh, or a substantially equivalent ease of use as soon as there's something additional that's put on a student to make it accessible for them. And that is, you know, it is essential. Those, those tools are, are filling a critical gap. It's not a criticism of the tools, but just a really important distinction to make that the, when we're talking about accessibility, uh, we're, you know, we're talking about everybody being provided the material that they need at the same time with equal effectiveness and equal integration. We have time for a couple more questions. Like... You got to be better than that third grader, though. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is Ian Kishore, CEO of Benetech. Gabriel, we make Bookshare, which allows you to read a whole bunch of different books in the way that makes sense for you. Some of the ways that have been described here, voice, etc. 
The question I have for the panel, and thank you for this engaging conversation, is, you know, whenever I go to schools and I see students, you know, using, uh, you know, just different sorts of edtech tools, right, games, etc., and very rich, immersive experiences, virtual reality, all of that. Uh, my question back to you all is that, you know, outside our bubble here, which is obviously people who are concerned about accessibility in technology, how are we reaching this explosion, you know, all these startups building tools so that we can make sure that those tools are available to everybody? Take. I think um, something that has been very efficient for me at Science Week is understanding where they're coming from and understanding that some people have, the, the people that have some capital and the power might have never experienced accessibility and allowing them to ask really dumb questions that for us is like, wait, no, that's really evident, and allowing them to ask those questions and then make that connection with them so that they can then go ahead and make those decisions. Um, the, the unfortunate thing is that a lot of the questions that I face is, well, how many people would this affect? Um, how much would it cost to implement, right? Like really operational um, sort of, conversations and you need to sort of like take them away from that and really bring it back to the story, that emotion of like, here it is. And, th and that's why I love partnering with Nico because I think Nico allows that problem to become alive for a lot of people that don't experience it. So really relying on that emotional conversation and then coming in with a very practical plan on how it can be done. And you would, at, at least for me, it's been shocking to me the amount of people that have opened up their minds and their pockets, thank you investors, to make accessibility technology happen. It was, this oh, this is, ahead. I'll just say two quick things, three actually. One is, um, you know, I really compliment CAST for the work that they're doing to raise, raise the bar and raise attention. I think the game industry is starting to look at accessibility in interesting ways and, you know, that will have benefits um, that, that, that's, that's going to drive a lot of this forward. Um, the, the reality is that those questions they ask when you're talking with them, yeah, are, are, they're, they're, the, they're real questions. I mean, how much is it going to cost? So we're still we're, we're going to still struggle with that, um, no matter what. And I think there is still a little bit of that sense of when we talk about interesting and innovative action for students. There's the work that we do in the disability sector, and then there's the work that is happening in the non-disability sector. And I don't think those two have come together well enough yet. Certainly organizations like APH can, can play a role and we're trying to bridge some of those gaps um, to have conversations to, you, you know, to see how our technologies can play a role in uh, the more interesting digital and virtual environments that are being created. But I, I really have a lot of hope that the, the groundwork that we've laid across the technology access work that's been done over the years, the, the fact that companies have brought experts in at many different levels who work, who work and live in these issues and in many cases have the disabilities, um, will start to yield some uh, really nice gains as people recognize that we can actually implement accessibility in lots of creative ways across that virtual environment. And to add just one note, I think it's important to think about, and I think about many movements when we're thinking about how do we create um, a movement around accessibility. And I draw back a lot about the movement that I see within the Latinx community and the black community. And something that is really important is just to get research out there of the power of this community. Um, recently there was a, a report showing how many people have reported disability after COVID, right? And that has opened a lot of conversations around like, oh my God, this is actually a massive problem and how are we gonna tackle it, right? So I encourage uh, people and, and institutions to really continue doing the work of, of, of publishing numbers behind it because I think that that drives a lot of it. I mean, the disability community is massive. It has massive economic you know, um, possibilities. The amount of things that, that can be unlocked is great. And I think focusing on that and, and really bringing in those numbers really helps drive the conversation forward sometimes. Well, thank you. We are 
over time. <laughs> so we're over time. We're actually over time. And we actually have a whole audience that has joined us remotely too as well. And I know they have questions, but we will do our best to actually get some of those questions answered by you all afterwards. But I want to just say thank you so much to this fantastic um, panel. And we really appreciate all the amazing work that you're doing. So thank you. <laughs>